Morning, Grace Baptist Church. We're glad you are here to join with us as we worship this God. I want to share with you just briefly something I read in my devotional this morning from a Desiring God. It says, The reason he, Jesus, became man was to die. As God, pure and simple, he could not die for sinners. But as man, he could. His aim was to die. Therefore, he had to be born human. He was born to die. Good Friday is the purpose of Christmas. This is what most people today need to hear about the meaning of Christmas. So as we gather around to adore our Savior who was born to die, he, was, he died so that we could become grafted into this family of God. What a beautiful truth to, to remember this morning. We're glad you are here. If you are new to Grace, if you're new here this morning, uh, there is a little brochure in the pew back in front of you. Please grab that. Uh, take that home with you. We'd love to uh, have you contact us if you need anything, and uh, we would ask of you as well that you would fill out the little perforated uh, information part on the back and put that in the offering plates as those come around here in a moment, or you can put that in the offering boxes uh, at the exits on your way out. We'd love to have a record of your visit and get to know you uh, better. Some announcements for the week. Remember, we have our new-ish uh, verse of the month for December uh, from Hebrews thirteen sixteen. It says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Uh, what a great way to remember to practically uh, glorify God by the way that we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
which brings us to a great segue. So uh, on Communion Day, which we're going to have the Lord's Supper here in a little while, uh, we also take up our Deacon's Benevolence Offering. And so that is a specific fund uh, to meet the local, or to meet the needs of our members here at this uh, church. So uh, if the Lord so leads you to give to that, please make sure you designate that uh, on your giving envelope or your check. Or if you give online, there's a spot for that uh, to make go to Deacon's Benevolence Offering. Uh, today, right after, not right after church, uh, from three to five, there is an international student ministry training. And so uh, this is kind of a uh, come and, and hear about this ministry. You coming doesn't guarantee like you're saying, hey, I'm all in. Uh, come and learn about what the international student ministry is all about and how you might be able to get involved in that. Joe, do you want to say something about that? Okay. Sure. So if you didn't get that, uh, if you can't come for the whole time from three to five, come for as long as you can, get some information, uh, meet the people who are over the international student ministry. Uh, that way we can kind of get you on their radar as well. So lots of different ways to get involved and serve our international students uh, at NSU and give them the gospel. Um, it's amazing that God is bringing the nations here to the belt buckle of the Bible belt. Um, pretty pretty low-hanging fruit for us to, to give the gospel to them. Also, for youth, uh, this Saturday, there's the Youth Progressive, uh, Christmas Progressive Dinner. Uh, what time is that, Joe? Yeah. You know? Meeting at the church at 4.30. If you have any more questions, talk to Joe Schmidt about that. And also, on Sunday, December 18th at 6 p.m. is our Christmas carol service. So, it's going to be a great time coming together that evening and uh, just singing more uh, praise songs and, and Christmas hymns to our Lord about that. Uh, also, Sunday School Kids. Uh, please make sure, if you're a parent of a Sunday school kid, uh, that you're practicing the songs for the Christmas uh, carol service. If you didn't get those songs, they should have been sent home with the kids. Uh, if you don't have those, uh, they're on the Women of Grace Facebook page. And if you don't have access to that, then you're not out of luck. Talk to Christy or Keisha, and they can get those for you guys there. Uh, youth and college, we're not having classes, uh, Wednesday classes, uh, this coming week, so... Uh, know about that. And also, I want to have a, a reminder to please uh, support the Suitors Move and Mission to Utah. So please, please, please be in prayer for Stephen and Paige and Shepard Suter as they're moving to Provo, Utah, uh, the first week of January uh, to do some church planting and, and minister to spe specifically Mormons there in Provo, Utah. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about their move and their mission, uh, there's a clipboard in the main hallway. Please check that out. Uh, or visit our, um, you see the website there, so I'm not going to read all that off there. Uh, and also, we got three more Sundays with them, so what better way than to maybe invite them out to lunch or dinner and uh, learn about what they're doing and get to know them so you can be in prayer for them. And also, please play, pray about supporting them if you're able to do that. I uh, also uh, want to have you keep in mind that for Christmas Day and New Year's Day, we are only having our 1030 service, no Sunday school that day, so please join us for that. And then, guys, you can see the Ironman Summit, the one-day conference, so look at the dates on that, and please make sure you register for that. We always have a great turnout, and it's a, a great weekend of just being encouraged and equipped uh, in the Lord and how to be uh, a godly man. And also, last thing there at your, um, the bottom of your bulletin, uh, just a reminder that, that we as the elders, we meet together the second and fourth Monday of the month to... Um, do lots of things to talk about the church, uh, to, to pray specifically for the church. So if you uh, do need prayer, uh, please let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can be lifting you up and uh, ministering to you there. So let's uh, go on with the service and go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father. We do, uh, we're amazed, we should be amazed that, that we can stand before you this morning, uh, know that you hear our prayer that you welcome and you receive our prayer. And this is only because of what you have done uh, on our behalf uh, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, help us to be amazed at your goodness, at your gospel this morning, uh, that we would sing these songs to you uh, from, a, from a true heart, a sincere heart that is grateful to you. Uh, Lord, that we would give of our tithes and our offerings uh, from a joyful, uh, generous heart, uh, because uh, you're worth it, Lord. So would you be honored this morning uh, as we sing these songs, as we give 
of our tithes and offerings as we hear your word preached to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing the Christmas carol. Good Christian men rejoice. a new Christmas song today by the Gettys. It's called Sing We the Song of Emmanuel. So if you know it, feel free to sing along. If you don't, feel free to sing along also, but you'll be learning. song of Emmanuel, this the Christ who was long foretold, low in the shadows of Bethlehem, promise of dawn, now arise, behold, God most high in a manger laid, lift your voices and now proclaim, great and glorious love has come to us. Joy now with the host of heaven. Come we to welcome Emmanuel, King who came with no crown or throne. Help us he lay the invincible, maker of Mary, now Mary's son. Oh, what will to save us all, shepherd sages before him fall, grace and majesty, what humility, come on, bend and be adored again. Go spread the news of the Emmanuel, joy and peace for the weary. 
Lift up your hands for your Jesus God. Sing for the light of the world's the dark. Glory shining for all to see. Hope alive that the gospel means. God has made a way. He will have the praise. Tell the world His name is Jesus. Glory shining for all to see. Hope alive that the gospel means God has made a way He will have the praise Tell the world His name is Jesus Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." What kind of king would leave his throne in heaven to make this earth his home? While men seek fame and great renown in lowliness, our king comes down. Jesus, Jesus, precious one, how we Would come 
from so small, from glory to a humble star. That dirty manger is my heart too. Please make it a royal throne for you. Jesus, Jesus, precious morning, GBC. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our journey through the book of Luke. Uh, we'll be in chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. This is the word of the Lord. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed. Because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I'm hearing such things? And he sought to see them. God, thank you uh, for your word. Um, Help us, God, as we continue in worship, God, through hearing your word. God, see how you work, God, in the lives of these 12 ordinary men. And God, and through you, Lord, you allowed them to do uh, great things. So, God, that gives us comfort because we are ordinary people. And, Lord, uh, through you, Lord, you, we get to serve you. We get to share your gospel. And so, God, help us to uh, live according to your word. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to ask you a question that I want you to think about, and it'll kind of resonate through the whole text we're going to look at this morning, but the question is this, who is Jesus to you? And again, I want you to think about that. Who is he to you? We are in the season of Advent, and this is the season leading up to Christmas, and most of you probably know, but the word Advent simply means the coming or the, the appearing or the arrival In the church, we often refer to the first and the second advent of Jesus Christ, his first and second comings to this earth. His first advent is what we're celebrating now with Christmas, the the first appearing of the Son of God in human flesh. And, And as we commemorate and celebrate the incarnation, we're also anticipating his return or his second coming. But I ask you that question because... How you answer it is vitally important for all of your life. Now, you might be thinking, well, maybe a better question is not who's Jesus to me, but who who is Jesus? And I'll say that that's absolutely key, who he was or is. The world has wrestled with that question for many years. In fact, Time Magazine Several years back now, I did an article entitled, Who Was Jesus? Some of you might have read that. 
And as you read that, the scholars are kind of all over the place as to who Jesus was or is. But I'm asking you the question, not who was Jesus so much as who is he to you? And much of your answer to that should be who he really is as we look at the reliable, inspired, inerrant Word of God. But your answer should also include your response to Him. James tells us that the demons believe some truths about God, and and they do what? They tremble. They shudder. And as we have been studying the Gospel of Luke, we have been gazing upon an unfolding of the presentation of Jesus where he was, what he did, what he said, his character, his focus. And so as we go through this book, we're meant primarily to see him so that we can know who he really is and who he was and so that we can respond rightly. It's not just about head knowledge. It's about what are you going to do with this? We need a correct view of Jesus and we need an appropriate view response to him. And that's, again, that's why I asked you that question. Who is Jesus to you? In Luke 9, we, we find the people of Israel are wrestling with that question of the identity of Jesus. Who is this man? You know, the disciples at this point, I don't know if you realize it, but this has been a year to a year and a half or so of his ministry. They've been with him for quite a while. And they had witnessed him do some amazing things. With just a word, he calmed the storm. With just a word, he casts out demons. He heals the sick. He even raises the dead. And they're wrestling with, who is this? Remember, was they're in the boat and he just spoke and calm. And like, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? But the evidence as we're going through Luke is just piling up, adding up. And they're asking that question, is he the one? Is he the one we've been waiting for? Is he the one that God has promised? And is he worth living for and dying for? Your understanding and your response to Jesus of Nazareth, I would dare say this, that's the most critical thing in your entire life. And I would encourage you this morning as as we come to this these few short verses in in Luke, that you would come with the intention to meet Jesus, to know him more fully, to see him more clearly, that you would would come here seeking him to help line your life and your affections to him, his glory, his kingdom. Because it's that kingdom, that's the only kingdom that's going to last forever. So again, my question, who who is Jesus to you? Does he have your affections and your life? Is he your Lord and your love? Is your life about knowing him and living for his glory? Or is your life simply about your plans and your comforts? I think it's good for us, I know it is for me, to ask these questions every now and then. I've just got to stop and where, where am I at? Where's my heart at? Because I don't know about you, but it's easy to drift for me. It's easy to be subtly influenced by the world. And honestly, it's just with my own sinful selfishness, desires, laziness. And we, have, we need to fight to set our minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So let's dive into the first nine verses here in Luke chapter 9. And seek to behold our King. Starting with verses 1 and 2. We read this again. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. All right, so this is kind of a transitional point in the book. Up until now, Jesus has been the one doing this. He's been the one teaching and, and healing. And his disciples have simply been there with him. And now he is taking his disciples And in particular, the twelve, and he is sending them out. And notice how he equips them to do the work. It says he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. How wild would that be? Can you imagine if Jesus, I'll just hand that over to you, and you could just walk downtown, casting out demons, walk into the hospital, and every disease flees 
at your word, at the name of Jesus, that would just be mind-blowing. I think here, too, one of the things we need to focus on is this, though, is the location of where that power came from. It came from Jesus. It, It was His to give. Oftentimes today, we hear this in other churches, that, you know, you just need to tap into your kind of your own inner strength and tap into that, that God part of you. Or if you just simply have enough faith, you can do these things if your faith is strong enough. But that's not what we see here in this text at all. No, Jesus, from his own power, gives it to them, the power and the authority. And think this too, this is interesting. Who's in the twelve? Yeah, Judas. Judas is in this group, the, the thief and the betrayer. It seems like he as well was a recipient of this authority and power and able to do the same things that the others of the twelve were doing. But Jesus sends them out with a twofold mission. The mission is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Again, they're going out to do the same ministry that Jesus has been doing for the past year and a half. And now what's going to take place is rather than just kind of a one-man show and limited to one person, now the ministry is going to expand a little bit further. They had watched Jesus do it, now they're going to do the same. And again, this is the same thing Jesus had been doing. Earlier in Luke chapter 4, a town had wanted Jesus to stay because he'd been casting out demons, he'd been healing everybody, he'd been teaching, they're all amazed, and they wanted to hold on to him. And he said this, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent For this purpose. Now, what do we do with with all this healing stuff? We've talked about it some as we've worked through the book. But the healings were important because they validated the truth claims that Jesus and the disciples were proclaiming, declaring. But the emphasis is not on the miracles and the healings. It's not on... It's not on those physical things. The emphasis of all that is taking place is getting people right with God, getting people into the kingdom of God. And I think as we think about that, we should realize this, is that's the same thing that we are, we are called to today, the same message that we have today. We should do physical acts of kindness to love and, and help others, but we must not lose focus on the main thing on helping people prepare to meet God. The church's work and message is not a social, political, philanthropic, or moral one. It is a message of sin, salvation, forgiveness, and the glory of God. I want you to think about this. If we met everyone's physical needs and we solved all of their physical problems, imagine if we had that power to do that, but we didn't help them prepare to meet God. What good would we really have done, people? And again, that's not the mandate we're given, is it? What's the great commission? To go and make disciples, to make followers of Jesus Christ. So here's Jesus. He sent sent the twelve out with his power, his authority, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And look how he sent them out, verse 3. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. Uh, Sorry, I was thinking about this, and we've got some young couples who are heading out to parts of the world, and so suitors, prats, you all are supposed to not take anything with you. Just go. Just trust God, head to Canada, head to Utah, sell it all, walk away, and just go. Okay, is this a prescription for how we're supposed to do ministry now? Well, let me put it this way. These men, at this point in time, had a clear word from Jesus about how they were supposed to do ministry at this time. In fact, it's going to change later in the book of Luke. I'll put it up here, Luke 22, 35 to 36. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. Now, here later in the ministry, he's referring back to what we're looking at right now in Luke 9. He said, I sent you out with nothing, but did you lack? Like, no, nothing. We were totally covered. God took care of all of our needs. And so look at the next verse with us, verse 36. He said to them, but now 
Let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. I thought that was kind of cool because suitors now in Pras, now you can actually, if you don't have a sword, go ahead and sell your cloak and get one. I don't have a sword. I think that'd be neat. But back in Luke 9, basically what Jesus was doing is he's charging them to travel light, to move from place to place easily and to be able to trust God. Like he was going to say later, did you lack anything? No. God took care of our needs. And Jesus was sending them out to rely upon, at that time, what would have been natural, under the law of God, Jewish hospitality. <clears throat> the basic law of hospitality in the law, under the law of Moses was that if a stranger was in your gates, you were to give him shelter, food, and hospitality. <clears throat> so Jesus is sending his disciples out to the Jewish people, expecting them to obey God's word. And look, look what he also said to him, verse 4. <clears throat> verse 4, and whatever house you enter, stay there, uh, stay there, and from there depart. So in other words, as you go into these towns, don't kind of pick and choose your favorite house. Oh, I got in this house, and they just serve kind of goulash, and I was hoping for, for some roast lamb, so I'm going to go switch the house down the street and just kind of move from place to place, finding the best deal. No, he's like, go in, establish your location. Whoever welcomes you, stay there, and there, from there, minister, heal, proclaim the gospel. The next part of his instructions, too, is kind of interesting. Look at verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, And we're... Wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. This is an idea that the Jews would have been familiar with. All right, so let's think back. <clears throat> when God was uh, speaking to Moses in the Midianite wilderness, and he calls him to himself in that burning bush. Do you remember one of the first things that God said to him? Moses, he wanted him to do something. What was it? Take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. It was holy ground because God was there. Okay, now think of the land of Israel in general. This is, this is God's place. Today we call the Israel, what do we call it? The holy land, right? It's the land that God promised Abraham and his descendants, the land itself is considered sacred. And so for the Jew, all other lands outside of the nation of Israel was pagan land, unclean land, the, the land of sinners, those outside of God, Yahweh's kingdom. And so what would happen is as a Jew had to do business outside the land of Israel, when they were coming back into the land, they literally would take their shoes and beat them together to knock all of the dust off so as not to bring contaminated land into the holy land. But notice what Jesus is doing here. He's taking that principle, and he's not sending them to the pagan lands, the Gentile lands. He's sending them to the Jews, into Jewish land, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What he's saying is this is going to be a testimony that these Jews are actually pagans. They're outside the kingdom of God. And I'm going to shake the dust off this, lest I take their contamination with me. That, I like that word there. He says, whoever doesn't receive you, but that word receive is a good one. The word receive means to welcome, to believe, or to take hold of. It's a great word, I think, for what it means to be right with God, to receive God, receive the message of the kingdom. To take the message of God's kingdom, we welcome it, we believe it, we take hold of it. But as the disciples were going to go out, there would be some towns who would not receive the word. All right, I want us to think about that for a moment and kind of bring it to 2022 for us. Why is it that we so often chicken out from sharing the gospel? Why do we so often become chickens and just don't do it? Why don't you share the gospel more faithfully, or at all maybe, with your coworkers, or your classmates, or your boss, or your hairdresser, or your doctor, or your professor. I think the bottom line is just one word, rejection. 
right? We are afraid that people won't welcome, believe, or take hold of the message of Jesus that we're telling them about. And we're afraid of being rejected. I, I think most everybody in here wants to win people to Jesus Christ. And, and we should. We should want that. And we should do it. We should strive to come alongside people, identify with them, and point them to the Savior. Tell them the truth of Jesus Christ. This is what we see all throughout Scripture. This is what Paul did. In fact, let me read what Paul did. I didn't put it up here, but just listen. Paul describes his ministry and he says this, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. So, so he's, in other words, he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act like a Jew when I'm around the Jews so that I don't put a stumbling block to them. I'm not going to put a hindrance by, and in fact, he goes on, he says, I'm not under the law, but I'm going to be like those under the law while I'm talking to them. And he says, to those outside the law, so to the Gentiles who aren't following the law of Moses, I'm not going to come in like a devout Jew wearing all my tassels and everything the way the Jews are going to do that. He goes, but I'm still under the law of Christ, but I'm going to live like they are, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. And I love this phrase, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. That's a great phrase. Okay, so let's imagine now that we do it perfectly. We go and we share the gospel. We, we identify with people per, per, perfectly. We don't set any hindrances to the gospel message. We share it. They understand it. We do it all right. Is that a guarantee that everyone we talk to is going to trust in Jesus Christ? No. It wasn't for Jesus. It wasn't for the disciples. It wasn't for Paul, and it will not be for us. We should prayerfully, boldly, and lovingly proclaim Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, to people trusting God for the results. Our job is not to land the deal. I, mean, I want to land them. But our job is not to force or coerce a positive reception is to be faithful to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. Some will receive it, some will reject it. And rejection should not throw us off track. In fact, let me put a quote up here by Charles Spurgeon. This is a great one. Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Church, many are not going to receive the message of Jesus. Unfortunately, so often we don't even give them a chance to reject it because we chicken out. But some will receive it. John 1 gives a great summary of how this same thing happened with Jesus himself. In fact, we'll put it up here. John 1, 11 to 13 says this. He, Jesus, came to his own. Talking about the Jews. He came to the Jews, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, just like with Jesus and the disciples, some are going to receive him. Some will believe in his name. They will become children of God. God will have worked in them so that they receive him. Church, it's God's work. It's his work. Our, our job is to be a mouthpiece, to proclaim he set it up, so that's the simple part. Just go and tell. Now, there, there's a scary thing, too, that's kind of in this verse here with this shaking off of the dust. Is that throughout Scripture, we see that there seems to come a time when God's patience and God's long-suffering ends. I remember being a foolish teenager, thinking 
in my rebellion, you know, someday I'll, I'll get right with God. Someday I'll get serious about the things of God and change. I, I knew it was all true. I believed it was true. But for now, I just, I was, I just want to have fun. Let me just go live it up, party. Thankfully, I have it tomorrow. And the Lord granted me repentance. But listen to this. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for any one of us. It's like the story of the rich man who was getting more and more. And so what he decided to do, let me build bigger barns. So I've got a place to store this. In fact, let's look at what Jesus said there in Luke 12. It'll be up here on the wall. Luke 12, 18 to 21. So here's what the rich man said. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Listen to me, if you are outside of God's kingdom, know this, tomorrow is not guaranteed for you. It is no guarantee that tomorrow you will have the time to repent and come to the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Repent now. Come to the Savior. Trust in Jesus Christ. You've got no guarantee about tomorrow. You've got right now. And I would say this too, and that's if you're outside of the kingdom, but Christian, listen to me on this. There's no guarantee that the person you've been meaning to talk to about Jesus Christ, that they have a tomorrow. Anybody ever had that? Somebody you, you knew you needed to witness to, and they moved away, or they died, and you never did? The response... So the message of the kingdom of God is simple. It's this, repent. Repent means to change our mind from embracing sin and rejecting Jesus to rejecting sin and embracing Jesus. We need to turn from living our own way and submit to the king. This was the message that Jesus proclaimed all throughout his ministry. In Luke 5.32, put it up here. Here's what he said. He said, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. That is the same gospel message that the 12 went out and proclaimed when they went out and proclaimed the gospel. We don't see it in Luke, but if you did the parallel account in Mark 6, it says they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. So the word that would come to us right now, I think, is this, is repent before it's too late. At what point is it too late to repent? Well, it's too late once you die. Scripture says it is appointed for man to die once and after this judgment. So at that point, it's too late. The other point is too late is when Christ returns. When he returns, your fate is sealed. And he, you will be judged. We will all be judged. So that point is too late. But there, there's one other, and this is the part that's, that's kind of scary. It's too late to repent when your heart is too hardened to submit to God and then God hands you over to his judgment we see this happening throughout scripture remember in the days of Noah how a man was wicked over all the earth and, and God said this my spirit shall not strive with man forever and the day of judgment came we see this also in the book of Revelation Revelation twenty two eleven says this, Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy. And it's like there just comes a time when God says, I'm done. I'm done. You're locked in your sin. Mercy is not coming to you. It seems like that time comes when God hands an unrepentant sinner over to their sin. We see this in Romans 1, right? Romans 1 talks about this. It says, Therefore God gave them up. He gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I don't know if there are worse words in the Bible than that. God gave them up. Let us not tempt the Lord. You cannot hear the gospel message and be neutral to it. 
You either receive it, basically you receive Him, yielding to Him, worshiping Him, submitting to Him, or you're going to continue to add wrath until the day of wrath comes. You cannot take Jesus Christ and your sin. You cannot have your adultery and have King Jesus. You cannot have your greed and have Jesus. You cannot have your porn and have Jesus. You cannot have the world and Jesus. So please don't reach that place where Jesus shakes your dust off of his feet, signifying that he's done with you. Repent now and come to the King of Kings. Now briefly, I want to look at the next few verses, and we'll see a man who, although he's interested in Jesus, in the end really seems to reject Jesus. But he's the one who asks the all-important question, who is this man? Look at verses 7 through 9 with me again. 7 through 9. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Okay, there are, there are several Herods in history. and In fact, probably the Herod you're thinking of, the maybe the one that first comes to mind, is Herod the Great. This is not Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one who sought to kill the baby Jesus right after he was born. He was the king of all of Israel, appointed by Rome. He ruled from 37 B.C. to around 1 B.C. Again, this is not him. This is one of Herod's children. This is Herod Antipas in our story, one of the sons of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas was given a quarter portion of the nation of Israel to rule. That's what a tetrarch means. It means a ruler of a fourth or ruler of a quarter. Herod wanted to be king, and he wanted people to call him king. In fact, this would eventually get him in trouble with Rome. But he was not a king. He was a tetrarch. Well, just to lay some background, Herod had been married to another king's daughter in a political alliance. But he wanted a different wife. He wanted his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. And so he sent his wife away and married his brother's wife. And you're probably going, this is just craziness, right? Well, this brought condemnation from God's prophet, John the Baptist. And John spoke out and denounced him for his immoral actions. Herod seemed to respect John the Baptist, knowing that he was a righteous man. But his wife was furious at the public humiliation. And so Herod eventually relented and he he had John um, uh, imprisoned. Well, in fact, let me read the section in Mark that describes this. It's a fairly lengthy section. It's Mark uh, 6, verses 17 to 29. It should be up here on the wall. We read this in Mark. It says this, For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him put to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. I think it's interesting. And yet he heard him gladly. It's interesting. Here he's Hearing this message, but he's, he's still wanting to hear from John the Baptist. Let's keep going. Verse 21 to 29. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. 
What a grisly picture. Can you just imagine that? This, this young girl carrying this platter with John's head on it. But it seems that Herod was a man burdened by guilt over this. We don't see a whole lot of it in our text, but in, in Mark we read that over and over again he kept saying, this is John back from the dead, the one I beheaded. And so it seems like his guilt was just really laying on him. But, so they're all wondering, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Is it John? Is it Elijah? Is it one of the prophets? It seems like they should have known that it wasn't John. Why? Well, because Jesus and John were alive at the same time, right? They were ministering at the same time. In fact, when John was in jail, he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him if he was the one that they should be waiting for. But we've got this rumor mill floating around there in Israel, and, and all of the information that's coming about this Jesus, this miracle-working rabbi, is traveling from mouth to mouth, and everybody is just speculating and wondering. Herod asked the question that's baffling people, who is this man? And church, listen, that's what we've been seeing as we're studying the book of Luke. We're seeing who is Jesus. He's been proving it over and over. The Jews were expecting Elijah to come before the Messiah. In fact, I think that, I was trying to remember if this was something that was covered when the Jews for Jesus came. But Jews to this day set a chair to the side that no one sits in, and that's reserved for when Elijah is supposed to come before Messiah. And even during the, during the Passover meal, they'll have one of the young children during one portion of it will run to the door, open it, and just see if Elijah's there. Well, why would the Jews think that Elijah was supposed to come before Messiah? Well, the last prophet of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Testament, the book of Malachi, here's what we read, we'll put it up here, Malachi 4, 5. <clears throat> the Lord says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh. Okay? Now, Jesus tells us in the New Testament that John actually served in the Elijah role. I'll put that up here, Matthew eleven thirteen 13 and 14. It says this, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. It's interesting there, he says, if you're willing to accept it, he's Elijah. In other words, John's identification as Elijah wasn't predicated upon his actually being Elijah, but rather the people's response to his role. To those that were willing to believe in Jesus, John the Baptist functioned as Elijah, for they believed in Jesus as the Lord, as Yahweh. The religious leaders rejected Jesus. And John the Baptist, for them, wasn't Elijah. They rejected John, they rejected Jesus, and therefore they rejected Yahweh. All right, I know there's a lot of rabbit trails and a lot of historical detail we could spend focusing our time on, but I just want to home in just on this last verse in our text for a minute. Verse 9 again. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Who is this? And again, bring it back to us. How you answer that question and how you respond to that question, or really how you respond to him, to Jesus, that has eternal ramifications. Herod didn't understand who Jesus was, but he was interested. He was really hoping that he could get to go and, and see him do some things and maybe hear him. And I, I guess maybe today we would label Herod a seeker. He was interested in seeing Jesus and learning more about him. I mean, who wouldn't, wouldn't you want to see this? I mean, this miracle worker who's raising the dead and lepers are, are, are cleansed and you know, all these amazing things. But that's where I think the end of it was for Herod. That's all he wanted. It was just to see something cool. In fact, we'll, we'll, we'll recognize this later on in the book of Luke. Toward the end of the book, Luke 23, verse 8 to 11, put it up here, says this. All right, so let me, setting here. This is when Jesus is on trial, and he's brought before Herod as part of the trial processions. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. See, there's the key. He says, I want to see something cool. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. Imagine how infuriating that would be. 
Here he's waited all these years to see this Jesus, and he gets there and he's not going to do anything. He's not even going to speak. And then verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him, and Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraigned him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. Well, obviously, Herod's interest in Jesus didn't lead him to the right place, to the right answers. You know, there's a, there's a lot of interest in Jesus even today in this world. Not just from Christians, but from many, many avenues. But how you view Jesus and how you respond to him is absolutely critical. Listen, listen to these words of Jesus in John 8. I'll put it up here. John 8, 23 and 24. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I hope you can see it up there, but that word he is actually in italics. You know what that means? It means it wasn't in the original words of Jesus. In fact, what Jesus said is, says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Well, what's, what's he referring to? Well, let me throw another verse in there. Next couple of verses, or a few verses farther on, John 8, John 8, 58, 59 says this. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. Well, what did, what's Jesus mean by that? What did he mean by that statement, I am? Believe that I am. The Jews in our text, they understood what he was saying, who he was claiming to be. That's why they were going to pick up stones to kill him, because they believed he was committing blasphemy. Well, what was he claiming? He was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be Yahweh. This, should, this would have and did take the Jews back to Exodus 3 in their minds. We'll read this in Exodus 3. This is God speaking to Moses, Exodus 3, 14 and 15. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me me to you. And so friends, this is the answer to the question of who Jesus is. He is God. He claimed to be God. He demonstrated that he was God and he is God. He is the King of Kings. He is salvation for all who come to him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. But listen to me on this. It's not enough to answer the question correctly. It really comes down to this. Do you receive him? Do you welcome him? Do you believe in him? Do you, do you take hold of him? The correct response to Jesus is not simply interest. Herod had an interest in Jesus. He was a fan I think, honestly, I think this is what we see in country music today, isn't it? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of interest in Jesus, a lot of Jesus talk. But the correct response to Jesus and the truth of Jesus is not just interest. And the correct response also is not this. It's not just mental assent. It's not just agreeing with the truth. I spent the first 20 years of my life away from God, and yet I believed it was all true. The demons, again, they believe and they tremble. The question comes down to, I think, is this. Has God shown in your heart to give the, night, the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus? Is that how you see Jesus? When you see Jesus, do you see the glory of God shining in his face? Have you taken a hold of him as your Lord and your Savior? Because here's the truth. He is worth living for and dying for. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us the book of Luke, which lays out so well the reality and the truth and the, the power and the presence and the identity of Jesus Christ. And 
Father, thank you for that message that has come to us 2,000 years later, that call to repent so that we can enter into your kingdom through the Savior, through the Son whom you provided for us. God, would you grant us eyes that can more clearly see the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, would you first and foremost help everyone in this room, bring everyone in this room to a place where we are embracing Christ, receiving Christ, holding on to him for our own salvation. But then, Father, I also pray that as the disciples were sent out, that you would send out us, remove from us our unfounded fears of rejection. You've told us that Christ will be rejected and that we will be rejected. Why should we fear that? So fill our mouths with love for our boss and our neighbor and our family member, our co-worker. And fill our mouths with the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this season, Lord, where we focus on the incarnation, the, the first advent of Jesus, that he came to come in human flesh that he might die and purchase us to be your children. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for our Savior. It's his mighty name we pray. Amen. When his first advent, the Lord Jesus Christ, King of glory, took his very first breath in a stable, laid in a manger, and where was his last breath? on a cross between two thieves. He did that to bring God glory by saving a people just like us, a people that he could love and bless forever. And that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. The Lord's Supper is us remembering what our Savior did to purchase us out of our sin, to pay the death that we deserve so we could be with him forever. What a God we serve. Again, I know I share this each time, but we practice a form of open communion, and that means this, is if, if you're a believer, if you are united to another body, another church somewhere um, that preaches the same gospel you just heard, then you're, you're part of the family. And so this is a family meal. So join in with us. Parents, this isn't juice and cracker time. Uh, let this be a time for you to testify to your kids of the importance of, of their need to repent and trust in the Savior before they come to the table. Also, if you're an unbeliever, this, this is not a fit. You're not part of the family. I don't mean that to be rude, but your father is actually the devil according to Jesus. And today would be the day to lay that down, to just, to just trust in Christ. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. He saves. He did the work on the cross. When he said it's finished, it was. Every bit of sin was paid for. He died. He rose from the dead that you could be forgiven. So come to Christ. And if you're not willing to do that yet, then this is, this is not a table for you. This is a silent sermon. You can just watch. The warning that we have in 1 Corinthians 11 Remember, this is a warning for us as, the, as a church. I think it also serves for an unbeliever, but it really should serve for us as God's people. I'll put it up here. <clears throat> Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You see, when they had that, that first supper uh, there in Corinth, when they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, there was, the rich people were coming in, eating all the food and ignoring the poor. In other words, the relationships within the body were, were a mess. And so I think part of the application for us on this is if you've got a problem between you and a brother or sister, get that right before you come to the table. Well, Lord willing, we'll be here next month and uh, have it again. You can sh participate in the table then. But also I'd say this, is that if you're, if you're harboring sin and you're not dealing with it, you're not repenting, get right with Christ before you come to the table. Deal with Him. A couple of our elders are going to come forward now and they're going to remove the table coverings. Kyle's going to serve the praise team while we're singing. But during the first song, you can make your way down the center 
um, grab a, a cup and a, and a piece of bread. Um, there's a table in the back. The table in the back is primarily for the folks in the balcony. And so if you're here on the floor, come this way. Come down the middle and go back out the side aisles. That way we've got a good flow of traffic there. But take them back to your seat and hold on to them, these elements. We'll take them together after the first song. So let's, let's sing together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but
I think sometimes we lose the, just how, what a crazy message that is. I mean, what if we're singing, oh, the wonderful electric chair, or the wonderful needle of death. And that's, this is what Jesus did. He hung on the cross. This is the only way you and I could be forgiven was this one who, in compassion, cast out the demons and raised the dead and healed the sick, fed the multitudes, that the Son of God had to die. That was the only way we could be forgiven. What an amazing God. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 24, read this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, don't take it yet. I'm going to read one more passage of Scripture. In Hebrews 10, 19 to 23, we also read this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So, brothers and sisters, his body broken for us. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 11, we read this. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then also in Hebrews 9, we read this. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, After that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So church, are are you eagerly waiting for him? His blood offered once to take away our sins. Let's sing one more song and rejoice together. Glory to God For unto us the Savior is born Jesus our King Came down to earth his people to free, let the redeemed let us sing was
Rejoice. Rejoice. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Jesus Christ, the Lord. Rejoice. instructed Aaron the priest to bless the children of Israel by speaking God's name over them. I want to do that for you today. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his face on you and give you peace. And in his peace and his blessing you are sent.